Well, good day and uh, welcome to Glasnost in our time where we try to look at the world rationally in the hope that it will look rationally back. I'm your host, Anthony D'Agostino. It's the 30th of August, uh, 2022. In the Ukraine, the war is grinding to a uh, seeming halt. Actually, it is a grinding Russian advance. There are long range missile strikes by Ukraine. Both sides appear confident in their prospects for a long war. The world economy is adjusting to a new division of labor dictated by a new global coal war. President Joe Biden has signed a rather misnamed Green Public Works Bill. He's allowing himself a bit more confidence about the November elections, but he's also held some meetings lately with historians, and he has asked them a question about the threat of a possible civil war in the United States. Is the struggle between Democrats and Republicans changing from a normal Anglo-Saxon alternance, as the French would, would say, into a revolutionary struggle of opposites? Is the United States now two nations who cannot agree about uh, basic principles? The New York Times recently interviewed some high school teachers about what they teach and whether they teach uh, critical race theory in particular. They all reported that they teach that the founders and especially Thomas Jefferson, whatever else they wanted to say about him, that he established an American constitutional commitment to the idea that all men are created equal. They all agreed on that. But is that right? Two law professors, Ryan Durfler, and Samuel Moyne argued in a slightly different way in a recent op-ed piece, also in the New York Times. It was called, Liberals Need to Change the Rules. Uh, they said that constitutionalism has got the upper hand over democracy. They said that Congress needs to pass laws to, quote, reclaim America from constitutionalism, end quote. The right is saying that they should be tarred and feathered. But if we all decide to slow down and read a book about this, the one I would recommend is this one by Kermit Roosevelt III, The Nation That Never Was, published this year by Chicago University Press. Roosevelt is professor of law at the University of Pennsylvania. The Nation That Never Was tells the story of the US in terms of its basic documents. And it perhaps shows the alternance, the variation uh, between democracy and constitutionalism in a new way. So welcome to Glasnost, uh, Kermit Roosevelt. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. When I was a grad student, uh, we marched against Jim Crow and we complained that our teachers uh, made it out that Reconstruction was a wretched excess and people like uh, Thaddeus Stevens and Charles Sumner, the congressional champions of Reconstruction, that they were ideologues and sort of fanatics. Who was right about that? Well, I think you were right about that. Um, but you know, one of one of the really striking things about American history is that you know they say the winners write history, and in some respects that's true. You know, I think you see that in our treatment of our history with Native Americans, for instance. But with respect to one of the really central conflicts of American history, the Civil War, we really let the losers write history. We accepted a Southern version of history, um, you know, which gave rise to some mistaken notions about the causes of the Civil War, I think, whether it was about states' rights in some abstract sense, or whether it was about the very concrete issue of slavery. And also, it gave us a misleading picture of the aftermath of the Civil War, and in particular, Reconstruction. Um, because if we look back with clear eyes, I think we can see Reconstruction as a tremendously promising period in which great things were accomplished. Um, and more than that, I say we can see Reconstruction as the real birth of our nation, the birth of an America that is committed to values of universal liberty, not just liberty for certain privileged insiders, and also equality. Equality is a value that I think is really pretty much absent 
from founding America, Thomas Jefferson, the Revolution, 1776. And it really enters our Constitution with the Reconstruction Amendments. So I think you're right about Reconstruction. I think Reconstruction was a great thing. I think it, its failing was sort of two things. One, it didn't go far enough. We didn't redistribute land to the formerly enslaved, which we should have done. And two, we abandoned it. So for a while, there was a functioning multiracial democracy. Um, but it relied on federal military support because it was consistently under attack from white supremacist paramilitaries. And when the federal government withdrew its military support, the integrated reconstruction governments were not able to sustain themselves. Does that mean that the, uh, the civil war was fought to, against the constitution? It's a struggle against the constitution? Well, it depends on what constitution you're talking about. And different people have different theories about this. And, you know, I should say, I'm not someone who believes that on deep foundational questions like this, there is an objectively right answer. There are answers that people agree on. There are answers that are more or less useful for particular purposes. What people are offering are different perspectives. But from my perspective, I would say the Founders Constitution, the 1787 Constitution, is pro-slavery in a bunch of ways. And it's pro-states' rights. And the Civil War ends up as a war against slavery. So it goes against some of the basic principles of the Founders' Constitution in that sense. And then it ends up in Reconstruction as sort of a war against state sovereignty. So the national government acting through Congress with the Reconstruction Act annihilates the southern states. It dissolves their legislatures. It declares that no government, no legitimate government exists in the former Confederate states. And then it rebuilds them. So this is certainly a war against the ideas of state sovereignty and sort of inviolable state representation in the Senate, for instance, that you find in the Founders Constitution. And my way of thinking about it is Congress wipes out the former Confederate states and makes new states. Those new states ratify a new constitution when they ratify the 14th Amendment, and that's the birth of a new America. Modern America is Reconstruction America. It's not founding America. Uh, Reconstruction then is our, that's our, uh, that should be our founding, a uh, founding idea, I guess. Yeah, that should be our founding moment. I mean, you can define it in different ways. Like when we talk about the founding that we talk about now, you could say 1776 with the Declaration of Independence. You could say 1787 with the drafting of the Constitution. You could say 1791 even with the Bill of Rights. And there are different dates that you could pick during the Civil War and Reconstruction. So 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation or the Gettysburg Address, or later 1868, the ratification of the 14th Amendment. But my central claim is it's the Civil War and Reconstruction period that give us our America. Right. Our America is not born in 1776. That's a very different nation with a very different set of values. So um, let's see. Um, uh, I, uh, I think I see some criticism uh, that you make of some other people, some prominent people who have written about this uh, same topic. And uh, I'm thinking about uh, Sean Wilentz, for example, who was part of um, uh, Joe Biden's uh, meeting uh, recently. Uh, and Gordon Wood, famous American historian. Um, and uh, let's see, on page 28, you seem to say that um, um, they're not entirely right and uh, that their criticism of the uh, 1619 project of the New York Times, that they've launched some criticism of that. You say that criticism is uh, not quite right. Well, I think that that criticism is very overstated. Um, and I think that the whole reaction to the 1619 project is would you a tell, bit Would dismaying. you tell us for a minute what the criticism is as you see it? Sure. So there are a couple of specific claims that the 1619 project, particularly in early drafts in the magazine version rather than the book version made. And maybe the, the one that the critics focused on the most was a statement in the introductory essay that one of, I think they said that one of the main reasons the founders declared independence from Britain was to protect the institution of slavery. And that's what Gordon Wood and Sean Wilentz really pounced on. Um, and 
the writers of the 1619 Project actually took that criticism to heart and looked into it and said, you know what, that's probably an overstatement, right? And they modified it. And they said, for some of the founders, protecting slavery was one reason for declaring independence, which is, and this is, I think, an important thing to understand, more or less the consensus position among professional historians. So you can research what people say about the causes of the revolution, and you can look at what scholars have written about reactions in the American colonies, in particular to the Somerset decision, which is something that people talk about a lot. Um, the court in Britain declared a slave, an enslaved person who had been brought to England free. This decision was taken by many people to abolish slavery in Britain. And then there's a question, did the colonists see this as a threat? Mainstream historical view there is slaveholders were upset about Somerset and they saw it as a sign of their waning political influence in an empire that was turning hostile to slavery. So it's certainly plausible. It's within the mainstream of professional historical analysis to say the colonists were concerned about the future of slavery under the British empire. Um, and ordinarily, in a discussion between professional historians, you would expect people to say, well, you know, that's your perspective and there's some evidence that supports it, which there undeniably is. And here's my perspective and here's some evidence that supports me. Um, you know, for instance, people complained a lot about Somerset in the West Indies, but not so much in the American colonies. And I have a different perspective and right, I think I'm right. I think mine is more persuasive. But that's not what Gordon Wood and Sean Wilentz and the other historians said. What they said was, this is just a matter of fact. We're right and you're wrong. There are no two sides here. There are no different perspectives, um, you know, and you should retract this. And we have no perspective. We have no ideology. We're sort of neutrally looking down from on high and just telling you what the truth is. And that to me is a very disappointing reaction from historians, because to me, that's more the attempt to impose an ideology. Right, to say, we have the truth, anyone who disagrees with us is just wrong on the facts. I don't think that's what a professional historian does. I think that's what an ideologue does. And the reaction to the 1619 Project looks to me not like professional historian discourse, but really more like people who believe in a particular ideology perceiving a threat to their ideology and reacting that way. And of course, right, this got taken up and amplified by uh, legislatures around the country because it's this, this criticism by the historians that's being cited as justification for all of these anti-CRT bills where they ban the teaching of critical race theory in schools and they ban specifically by name sometimes the 1619 Project. Um, in Florida, actually, they ban any attempt to teach American history as anything other than the development of a nation based on the universal principles of the Declaration of Independence, which would ban my book, right? Because I say the principles behind the Declaration of Independence are not what we've been taught, right? If you think about the Declaration of Independence in the context of its time as a careful historian would from the perspective of 1776, all men are created equal means something very different from what it means now and what Martin Luther King and Abraham Lincoln said it meant. So they're really shutting down historical inquiry in the service of ideology, which I find very disappointing. Well, it just goes to show that the issue is getting very hot and very topical in the sense that uh, it isn't just uh, a discussion that's going on in uh, academia, but it's uh, something that Im impacts on politics and uh, in a, a very uh, explosive kind of, kind of way, don't you think? Yeah, well, it's something that people feel very strongly about. And I think that's justified. So, you know, there, there are two elements to the reaction to the 1619 Project and to these anti-CRT bills. And one of them, I think, is rooted in a desire just not to confront bad things that have happened in the past um, and not to acknowledge some of the bad things that Americans have done. And that's bad because we do need to be honest about the past. But the other element that's at work there, I think, is a desire to maintain a story of America that people can believe in, a story that shows us a nation we can feel proud of, we can feel love for. Um, and that, you know, I, I understand and I sympathize with. 
because it's important. This is one of the things that the book talks about. It's important for nations to have stories that bring people together in the service of shared ideals and tell us this is what we stand for. This is how we fought for these values in the past. This is what we want to think about and champion and make sacrifices for going forward. We need a story like that. And if you think that an accurate look at America's past is going to make people hate America, then that's a real problem. Well, I mean, obviously, we're, we're speaking of in terms of uh, uh, confidence and uh, that we say that an accurate look is going to make everybody uh, much more uh, reconciled to the democratic tradition. Or is it the constitutional tradition? Are they two different traditions? Well, it's an interesting question um, about the conflict between democracy and the Constitution, because the original Constitution is not a particularly democratic document, honestly. Um, the founding, relative to its times, it's pretty good in terms of democracy. But the Declaration of Independence, for instance, is not a pro-democracy document. There's nothing in the political philosophy of the Declaration of Independence that supports democracy. The Declaration of Independence has really two criteria for a legitimate government. One is it's formed by consent. So governments derive their just authority from the consent of the governed. And the second is it protects the natural rights of the people who form it. Right? To secure these rights, governments are instituted. And a monarchy can do that. A hereditary monarchy can do that. Um, if it were the case that monarchy was inconsistent with the political theory of the Declaration of Independence, they wouldn't have had to set out grievances against King George and try to show that he was a tyrant. They could have just said, he's a king and we don't believe in kings. But the theory of the Declaration of Independence was George's authority used to be legitimate, even though he's a hereditary monarch, because at some point in the past, the British people consented to the monarchy and the monarchy was protecting our natural rights. So it was legitimate, but now he's doing these bad things, right? Now he's but violating so, so, our natural so as, rights. So as you describe it, it's not a, uh, a revolt against monarchism as such, but it's a revolt against this particular monarch because he's a tyrant. Yes, yes it is. It's a revolt against this particular monarch because he's a tyrant. And the Declaration of Independence doesn't say the states can't set up monarchies. The states can do whatever they want. Now with the constitution, the original constitution, we progress a little bit further because the constitution says that the federal government will guarantee to each state a Republican form of government. We've got some kind of democratic element in there. But, and this is you know very striking and people don't really realize it, I think, there is no right to vote in the Constitution. There's no freestanding right to vote. There are some later provisions, Reconstruction and afterwards really, that prevent certain kinds of discrimination with respect to the right to vote. But the 1787 Constitution doesn't create a set of democracies. Um, it lets the states do more or less what they want in terms of who they allow to vote. And of course, the 1787 Constitution not only permits slavery, it protects it in various ways. So is that, um, is that consonant with uh, Stephen Douglas's idea, the um, uh, popular sovereignty, the thing that underlie, underlay the um, Kansas-Nebraska Bill of 1854? Yes, so this is, this is another thing about the original constitution, the 1787 constitution, that I think people fundamentally misunderstand, right? We think about the constitution now as sort of a charter of American values and a source or a protector of our fundamental rights so that it has a lot to say about the rights of individuals. But the original constitution really doesn't do that. The original constitution lets states do more or less whatever they want to people within their borders, including their citizens who are it's members like, of their like political community. It's like a treaty. Community. It's more of a treaty than it is anything Much else. more, yeah. So the original constitution comes into being to solve problems about interstate relations because the states are fighting with each other and about collective action because the states are not contributing to the common defense. So you can't get a federal army that will defend America because the states don't pull their own weight. Um, and to create a nation that can speak with one voice in terms of negotiating with foreign powers. But all of those really work not at the level of individuals and individual rights and natural rights. That's not what the original constitution is about. It's about state interests and interstate relations and international relations. 
So, I mean, this is a state's rights. So this is uh, what Calhoun argued, right? Yeah, in a sense. So there is a state's rights theory that's out there, and the original constitution is much more pro-state's rights than the post-Civil War constitution. Um, I think it is important to note that not a lot of people care about states' rights in the abstract. Generally, you get a conflict over a particular issue, and one side is in control of the national government, and the other side is in control of some state governments, and the side that's in control of some state governments is going to talk about states' rights. If you look at the, the run-up to the Civil War, the slave power for a long time was in control of the national government, and they were perfectly happy to use federal authority and suppress states' rights in the name of protecting slavery. One of the most striking provisions of the original constitution, the Fugitive Slave Clause, is an anti-states rights clause because it takes away from states their sovereign authority to determine the status of people within their borders. So England follows the rule that any enslaved person who breathes English air is instantly free, and it doesn't matter how you get there. If you get to England, you're free. Before the Constitution, the states could say that. So the free state of Massachusetts, say, could say, if, you, if your feet touch our soil, you're free no matter how you get here. The Constitution takes that away and says, if you're a fugitive, you are not free, you must be returned. Is there a different so, rule for, for the states uh, and for the uh, territories? Well, so the territories were subject to federal authority. Um, they weren't bound by the same constitutional provisions. Um, and you see a series of compromises or attempts at compromise. So um, there was a big question, as it turned out, whether Congress could ban slavery in the territories, which the Supreme Court ended up saying they couldn't do in the Dred Scott decision, and also whether Congress could put conditions on the admission of new states into the Union, whether Congress could require them to come in as slave states or free states. Well, and uh, this Dred Scott decision uh, seems to argue that uh, slave is a piece of property and that um, you can take this property with you as you go from place to place. And uh, no doubt during the period uh, they took the view, or at any rate, the, uh, the slave power uh, took the view that they could do uh, in the territories pretty much what they did with Texas. They uh, uh, moved their slaves into, into Texas and made it into a, a slave state and uh, as part of the union. Yeah. Now, based on what I said about the purpose of the Constitution, the purpose of the original Constitution, that actually turns into an anti-Dred Scott argument. So I think Dred Scott is wrong on that point. Um, if you think the Constitution is about individual rights, that would lead you to something more like the Dred Scott position, to be honest, right? Because you'd be like, hey, I have a natural right to own property. And the Constitution recognizes that and protects that, and the federal government can't interfere with that natural right. That's actually Tawney's argument in Dred Scott. And Indeed. it's sort of based on the Declaration Indeed. of Independence. Yeah. If you take what I was saying before, which is that the point of the federal government created by the Constitution is to deal with interstate conflicts, then you would say, you know what, there's a national conflict over slavery, and the federal government is going to make compromises and accommodations. And if, as part of that, compromise and accommodation, they say slavery will be banned in certain territories. That's the sort of thing you actually would expect the federal government to be able to do. So understanding the Constitution is less concerned with individual rights in the pre-Civil War era actually is an argument against Dred Scott. Hmm. Hmm. Very tangled, very difficult for a non-lawyer to, uh, na to navigate. We need your, uh, need your guidance through these things. Uh, um, uh, you say, um, uh, on a related topic, you say that the, um, uh, the Constitution actually had a sort of geostrategic uh, aspect to it, and you, um, you cite the work of um, uh, Akhil Reed Amar on this. Uh, um, could you spell that out a little bit more, geostrategic? Right, so geostrategic is, is Akhil Amar's term. Uh, you know, I, I, I took that from him. And my thinking about the Constitution has been influenced a whole lot by Akhil. I think he probably does not agree with much of what I say in this book. Um, but, you know, I should acknowledge he was my teacher at Yale. Um, I've read all of his books. I think they're wonderful. Um, 
And, and what he says in America's Constitution, a biography, is if you look at the preamble of the Constitution, it sort of tells you what it's about. Um, it's about a more perfect union. So it's about tightening the bonds between the states. It's about the common defense. So it's about allowing the United States to present a unified front against potentially hostile European powers. Um, and, you know, as I said, to field an army to which each state can be required to contribute rather than relying on voluntary compliance with requests from the Continental Congress. So the original constitution is really about interstate and international relations, right? It's not about protecting individual rights. Um, and there's maybe the starkest possible contrast with the governments described by the Declaration of Independence. So the point of government, the Declaration of Independence says, is to secure people's natural rights, to protect their lives, their liberty, and their ability to pursue happiness, to protect that against other individuals, right? Because that's the main threat. The Declaration of Independence says, start out imagining a state of nature, right? A world with no government and no laws, people's rights aren't secure because other individuals will come along and violate those rights. And so we agree to join together. We consent to subject ourselves to the authority of a government and the government protects us from other individuals. Now, does the constitution of 1787 protect us from other individuals? Absolutely not. There's no provision in the 1787 constitution that could be violated by an individual, right? It's all about the government. The first constitutional provision that could be violated by an individual, and this is important, is the 13th Amendment, which bans slavery. Um, could the federal government created by the Constitution of 1787 protect our natural rights? No, right? The Constitution in 1787 creates a federal government with limited and enumerated powers, which is the government we still have, and it can't pass a law that pro prohibits one American from killing another American, right? The most basic protection of life is beyond the authority of the federal government, which helps to highlight, I think, the extent to which the federal government is supposed to be dealing with interstate and international geostrategic issues. It's not about protecting the natural rights of individuals. That's something that the 1787 Constitution leaves up to the states because the framers trust the states. They think the states are the good guys. Basically, and, the states and, are going to do the right thing. And that is what Calhoun argued, more or less, right? Yeah. So, I mean, one of the things, one of the ways in which I differ most, I guess, was with Sean Wilentz, um, who talks about this a lot, is I take quite seriously the constitutional interpretations offered by John C. Calhoun and Jefferson Davis. I think they make a bunch of good points. Um, and Sean Wilentz often seems to reject that, but he rejects it just with an ad hominem argument, right? John C. Calhoun said that, and he's a terrible person, right? And he was pro-slavery. How can you be giving that argument a respectful hearing? Um, and the answer is, John C. Calhoun said those things at a particular time in order to promote slavery. And in the world of the 1850s, that was a pro-slavery position because you're dealing with um, the 1787 unreconstructed constitution. We're living in a different world. We have a different constitution. We can look back and say, this historical figure may have been right about this historical constitution. That's not our world anymore. So and, this is a, uh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, and so accepting those arguments, right? Accepting that Jefferson Davis was right about some things with the pre-Civil War Constitution, or that John C. Calhoun was right with some things he said about the Declaration of Independence, doesn't have the consequences nowadays that it would then. Um, and the only reason you might think it does is if you're really invested in this idea of continuity. So if you think we're the same people we've always been, if you think we fundamentally have the same Constitution that we always did. If you think the Declaration of Independence is this electric cord that binds every American to the founding generation, which is what Lincoln said, then you're very concerned about whether the secessionists or um, the nationalists are right about these documents because you think it has a direct impact for today. Um, and I'm saying we're a new America, right? Those debates are in the past. They're sort of 
of historical interest because they do affect the way that we should think about who we are, um, but they don't have the direct relevance that some people assume that they do. Well, you know, you can see why there is a search for legitimacy through continuity. Uh, and I think what your book is posing is that there are an, there's a, another way to think about legitimacy in terms of radical breaks in the continuity. I guess you have to say revolutions. And the, the, once you break up, uh, raise the question of um, these revolutionary changes that, uh, that in, in effect create their new foundations of liberty, um, I guess you have to say that it's even the case that the, sometimes the people are against are revolutionary and often uh, citing some of the same principles. If we think about the slave power trying to, uh, you know, uh, uh, expand into the territories, and then we think about the the uh, Illinois and Lincoln and um, and the other forces, you know, uh, uh, what Germans, Irish uh, settlers, all the rest trying to expand into the new territories themselves. And they both think that they have revolutionary ideas uh, driving them. Yeah, so what makes a government legitimate or what justifies a revolution or what justifies us in creating a new political order going forward? That's something that people often don't grapple with in the standard story. So we have this idea, there's the original revolution and it's legitimate somehow because of the Declaration of Independence. Although, you know, if you read the Declaration of Independence, um, some of it is less convincing and less appealing than others, right? There's these complaints about um, enslaved people rebelling as if that's a terrible thing. Um, and then people tend to just sort of suppress the idea of revolution and radical breaks with the past with this idea of continuity that we're the same people we've always been. It's the same America. Um, I think that the Civil War is a revolution. Um, and it's a revolution that basically destroys the political order of founding America. Um, you know, it starts out as a war for the status quo, where Lincoln is trying to restore the Union. And what the ultimate fate of slavery will be is sort of uncertain, right? The draft Emancipation Proclamation, the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation, says to the Southern states, return, return to the Union, or I will free your slaves, right? Return to the Union, or we will abolish slavery. So it's a threat, but it's also an offer, and it offers the possibility of return to the status quo. The final Emancipation Proclamation shows that there's a break, and Interestingly, Karl Marx, who was following the American Civil War and reporting on it, said the Emancipation Proclamation is tearing up the original Constitution. This is the revolutionary waging of war rather than the constitutional waging of war. Um, so now we've got a war with a different goal, right? We're going to remake the existing political order. There's going to be a new birth of freedom, as Lincoln says in the Gettysburg Address. And, you know, you have to ask, I think, what makes that legitimate? Why is it okay to say we're going to destroy the existing political order and reject the constitution that protected slavery? Um, and the answer, I think, is, is twofold. One, justice, right? This is the right thing to do. And sometimes you just have to say that. Sometimes you just have to say slavery is wrong and we're going to fight it. And it doesn't matter that it was respected by the prior constitution. Um, but, right, different people have different ideas of justice and sometimes people fight in the name of what they call justice and it's a terrible thing, right? So you can't give unlimited scope for subjective ideas of justice. The other thing that the Gettysburg Address gives us is democracy, right? Which I said the Declaration of Independence doesn't. The other criterion of legitimacy that the, De that the Gettysburg Address focuses on is government of the people, by the people, for the people, that's democracy. So one, we're pursuing this goal that we think is just, but we're gonna allow the people to exert some sort of check on that, right? We're gonna enfranchise people, we're gonna count everyone, and then we're gonna have democracy. This idea of equal concern and respect and ultimately an equal voice in the political process. So, um, so then um, to try to sum this up in a way that our viewers can uh, uh, take back with them, um, the Emancipation Proclamation is a, um, a revolutionary document uh, which uh, puts the Constitution on a new footing. Um, 
and it's followed by redemption, you say, uh, in the period of uh, developing Jim Crow, the end of the 19th century. Uh, then that makes the civil rights movement, the fight against Jim Crow in the 1960s, that makes that into a, a second reconstruction. And uh, then there's a second redemption after that, uh, which we might call a rebirth of Jim Crow. And so it's a kind of, I like to use this word alternance, you know, uh, uh, you know, the French refer to our, our political system as an Anglo-Saxon alternance, you know, the Republicans are in and the Democrats are in, actually alternate's a good thing in that way of looking at it. Uh, this is a kind of an alternance in history between uh, these uh, uh, really large tendencies. This is a big cyclical kind of argument about American history, is it not? Yeah, it is. So I think that American history kind of moves in hundred year cycles. So 1863, we've got the Gettysburg Address and the Emancipation Proclamation. And it's the articulation of what I call inclusive egalitarianism, inclusive equality. So the idea there is our political philosophy says our political community is open. You can join it birthright citizenship is going to bring people into our political community. And also we believe in equality, right? The government can and maybe should act to promote equality. What follows that is what I call exclusive individualism. So the political community is closed. Outsiders are dangerous. We don't want the government promoting equality, certainly not taking from insiders to give to outsiders, and really not taking from some insiders to give to other insiders either. Who are and, undeserving. They are undeserving. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Right. And so you can see that um, in the aftermath of Reconstruction, the period that people call redemption, when the white supremacists take power again, uh, because the whole point there is Yes, right, we've been forced by the 14th Amendment to extend citizenship to the formerly enslaved and their descendants, but they're not real Americans and we're going to try to exclude them from our political community and we're going to brand them as second class citizens with segregation and we're going to create a racially stratified society with racial caste, basically. Um, and then 1963, right, 100 years later, you've got the Civil Rights Movement, the Second Reconstruction, the March on Washington. The whole theme of that is inclusive, right? We're all real Americans and equality. This is when Martin Luther King is articulating the um, new understanding or the Reconstruction understanding of all men are created equal, which is the government should treat everyone equally or give everyone equal concern and respect. And the second reconstruction is followed by the second redemption. Um, so calling the civil rights movement the second reconstruction is very common among historians. Calling the period starting, I think, with the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980, calling that the second redemption is less common. But I think it tracks pretty well because you've got basically the same neo-Confederate ideas, right? The federal government is kind of the problem, right? We like states' rights. Why do we like states' rights? Because we want the states to be able to create classes of citizens. And what's the danger? The danger is that these people who are not real Americans are cutting in line for the American dream. This is the rhetoric you see, of course, later with Trump. And they're taking what rightfully belongs to the real Americans. So it's this exclusive individualism coming again to the top. And I think you've got cycles between inclusivity and exclusivity, between equality and individualism going through American history. And it's really sort of amazing. It's almost precisely 100 years. So what, is, uh, what does that mean for our position in the cycle right now? Well, we're in the second redemption. Um, and the <laughs> question is, you know, how far will it go before it turns? When can we turn it? How much will we lose? How much of what we gained in the second reconstruction are we going to lose? Hmm. You know, um, in the 19th century, I look at this uh, in terms of European history as, as well as uh, North American history, but in the 19th century to be a Republican and even to be a very oligarchically minded Republican by Gar, uh, that was quite revolutionary. Uh, and uh, Karl Marx, who you mentioned, uh, he celebrated the Poles and the Polish Revolution. And uh, that was quite an oligarchic affair. Uh, they were resisting uh, the, uh, 
the uh, um, emancipation from slavery uh, that had been imposed by the Russians. <laughs> so uh, the issue of Polish nationalism emerges in this uh, framework of, I don't know what you would call it exactly, uh, oligarchic or aristocratic uh, sort of constitutional, but it's quite, whatever it is, it's quite revolutionary. So uh, this attack of uh, January 6th, um, 1991, this putsch, uh, um, which uh, the whole world is uh, looking at the United States about and asking themselves, are, is anything going to be done by way of, of punishment or self-defense against this, uh, uh, this, this putsch, um, that the people who are the perpetrators and defenders of it uh, may argue that they're revolutionaries? Yeah, well, so I think that they can argue that they're revolutionaries. Um, you know, on the other hand, revolutionaries are traitors, typically. Uh -huh. So if you if you believe in the existing legal regime, revolutionaries are traitors. Uh -huh. Now, the founders of America were traitors, um, and we celebrate them now. And we can do that, I think, without a feeling of contradiction, because we're not British subjects, so it doesn't matter that they're traitors according to British law. Um, but maybe we should take that more seriously because you know when we celebrate these rebels against the national government we sort of embolden other people who want to rebel against our national government and we give them justification for doing that you know if we say rebellion against the national government is american patriotism then that's a tricky lesson to carry forward and keep under wraps um, because you've told all these people that if they think their rights are being violated, they stand in the shoes of Thomas Jefferson and George Washington when they say, we're going to take up arms to protect our, our understanding of our rights. On the other this hand, is one of the reasons why I like the Civil War better, because we're putting <laughs> down a rebellion. We're putting down a slaveholder's rebellion. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, the idea of, uh, of, um, of a... Um, of a revolution, um, well, I mean, it implies big changes, but big changes are done by legislation. And uh, have these revolutionaries got the right to say that we can't pass any more legislation uh, on account of their presumed revolutionary constitution, that, uh, that our government has to be absolutely hogtied and, and it, that it's impossible to change anything and to respond to the, the difficulties of our period, you know, which are not the difficulties of the 18th century. Well, no, I don't. I don't think they have that right. Um, I don't think they have the right to take over the government and reject the results of free and fair elections and install people that they want in power. Um, now, in some sense, I was saying I think they're sort of being true to the spirit of the revolution. I'm not such a fan of the spirit of the revolution. I was saying I like the spirit of Reconstruction. In another sense, they're not really going along with the founders' vision, though, and I think this is important to understand, in terms of what you said about paralysis, because it's now the case that our political system is gridlocked and it's very difficult to get things done. But the main reason for that is partisanship. We've got political polarization. We've got two different political parties fighting for power and fighting for control of the national government. And the party that is out of power basically wants to make the party that is in power fail and prevent them from doing anything good so that they can take power in the next election. And that is not at all what the founders envisioned. The founders did not envision political parties. So they had no idea of what would happen when you've got two parties fighting for control of the national government. They didn't think about the impact that would have on the ability of the national government to fulfill its job. And we've got a much less effective federal government than we should, because we've got political parties fighting for control within a system that wasn't designed for that. And yet, um, a, a third reconstruction, would, that, would I be correct in putting it that way? Uh, a third reconstruction is uh, really the way forward for us at, at the moment. And it has to be done by passing legislation, by asserting the rights of Congress uh, to pass a, what um, the two um, uh, professors that I just referred to, um, uh, Moyne and uh, Durfler say, 
uh, uh, Congress Act or something like that. Uh, that should be ABC, shouldn't it? Well, I, you know, I think we could get something like a third reconstruction through legislation. Um, I would like to see our political system reformed and overhauled in a way that made it more democratic. So I'd like to see us do an end run around the Electoral College with the National Popular Vote Compact. Um, I'd like to see us change the structure of the Supreme Court with term limits um, to make the composition of the court more rationally tied to the outcome of presidential elections. I think that would be an improvement. Um, I think there's a lot of structural things that we could do. Um, and we can do most of them through legislation or through interstate compacts. It doesn't require constitutional amendment. Um, I think it might also be a good idea. I mean, I don't think this will happen, but I think it'd be a good idea to make the constitution easier to amend, probably. This is something that uh, law professor Jed Purdy recently suggested um, in a piece that's an interesting counterpoint to the Moyne and Durfler piece. Yeah. I noticed that the uh, New York Times uh, this morning has uh, said, uh, asked the question, is the Constitution obstructing democracy? Uh, as it, it gave that as a, um, as a title for um, several letters and, uh, and the letters are very tangled and confusing. I challenge a law professor to dope out uh, everything these people are arguing in these letters. Uh, but how would you answer that question if they uh, put it to you? Is the Constitution obstructing democracy? Yeah, I think absolutely. Um, you know, I mean, on the one hand, the Constitution creates a framework that is, broadly speaking, democratic. So that's a good thing. You know, on the other hand, there are concerns about um, like pure majoritarian democracy. So we don't necessarily want that. In some ways, we do want the Constitution to be frustrating democracy. But I think it's doing it more than it should and in ways that we don't want. So. I'm very opposed to the Electoral College, right? I think we should have a national popular vote for president. Um, the Electoral College was created for a couple of reasons, some of which are quite unsavory. A lot of it had to do with slavery, to be honest, um, and none of which is a good reason now. So there's really no good reason why we still have the Electoral College. Um, I think that the Supreme Court, the fact that appointments to the Supreme Court depend on strategic retirement and the random chance of ill health striking a justice and partisan hardball, you know, whether senators can refuse to hold hearings on a nominee. Composition of the Supreme Court is so far out of line with the outcome of presidential elections that we're seeing a Supreme Court that's very much out of step with the American people, right? And the source of conflict between the court and the people is the fact that we don't have a more democratically linked method of determining when appointments occur. Mm -hmm. So in a lot of ways, I think the Constitution, you know, with structural features is thwarting democracy. I, I don't worry so much if the Constitution thwarts democracy with rights protecting features. Um, I don't think I agree with the Supreme Court's interpretation of the Second Amendment, but it makes some sense to say here are constitutional rights that are protected against majoritarian um, intervention. But with respect to the structure of government, I'm pretty pro-democracy, and I think the Constitution is thwarting that in undesirable ways. Well, um, suppose the opponents of uh, the democratization that we're talking about, suppose they get their way further, suppose they get a government uh, for example, in, in a couple of years. Um, they're liable to change a lot of things. Do you think that uh, they are going to go a lot further in a Calhounistic uh, kind of, I can use that term? <laughs> well, I think that they're going to try to lock themselves in. So this is, I think, the best way to understand what happened politically over the past. I mean, well, you know, it, it goes back pretty far. But over the past five or six years, what we saw was a minority of the American people taking control of all three branches of the federal government. So Trump is elected by a minority, right? He loses the popular vote. The minority captures the presidency. In the Senate, senators who represent 
a minority of the American people, and it's a small minority, because uh, the malapportionment in the Senate is wildly extreme. Senators who represent a minority of the people exercise majority power. And in the House of Representatives, because of the partisan gerrymander, you get, I'm not sure that this precisely quite happened, but you certainly have the possibility that a minority of voters will elect a majority of representatives. And then your minority elected president nominates Supreme Court justices who are confirmed by the senators representing a minority of the population. And the minority has taken control of the federal government. And that is a bad thing from my perspective, right? It's okay to have features that protect a minority, but features that allow the minority to take over the government and do what it wants with the government, I think that's wrong and anti-democratic. So minority took over the federal government. The majority asserted itself and it was able, because our system is still a little bit democratic, it was able to push the minority out of the presidency because Biden won, push them out of Congress, right? So the Democrats recapture Congress, um, but not the Supreme Court, right? Because the Supreme Court turnover is slow and unpredictable. And what we're seeing now is the minority trying to take back power. And if they take back power, I think they will understand that if they allow free and fair and open elections, they'll lose because they're the minority. So I think you can expect to see them try to restrict voting. Right, they're going to try to undermine democracy to lock themselves in power so that we can't get it back. And if you look at the way that the Supreme Court has helped this along by gutting the Voting Rights Act and allowing states to put in new restrictions, and if you look at the way that states have taken up that invitation and the new restrictions on voting that states have enacted, I think you got to be very concerned that we might lose the political branches to this minority again, and we might never be able to get them back. Well, this is a uh, fantastic discussion, fascinating, illuminating discussion. Um, let me ask you one last question. When we put things in these large terms of um, constitutional history and political theory and everything, the opposites always seem very, very sharply opposed and uh, they, you know, I know that it's not just verbal, they were sharply opposed in history, but when we put things that way, um, are we overlooking the possibility that there is uh, there are forces for reconciliation, for smoothing over any of this, or does it all have to come to blows? And uh, how do you see the prospects for reconciliation of these opposites in the future? Well, you know, it's it's hard to say. I don't think that we're headed for a civil war because we don't have the regional division that you would need for that. Um, you know, this isn't really to a certain extent, like there's north and south, there's coasts and center, but it's mostly urban and rural. So even within a red state like Texas, there are very liberal cities. You know, the cities are pretty much all blue. Um, so since we don't have a regional split, I don't think we're going to have a sort of secession civil war version 2.0. Um, you know, we do have a lot of conflict. And I, th I think the real question is whether we can find common ground and maybe more specifically, whether we can find common ground that doesn't involve giving up on our goals for justice. Because as I said before, when Americans come together in the past, um, it's often white Americans coming right. together at the expense of racial justice. And we need to not do that again. But I do think that there is common ground and there is the possibility of moving forward with this idea of a nation that we can all believe in and a nation we can be proud of. Um, but that's reconstruction America. That's not founding America. So that's a good sentence, good way to wind things up. Reconstruction America is really uh, what we need to talk about. Okay. Uh, uh, this has been a fantastic discussion and uh, uh, I would love to, for it to carry on and on. Um, but I guess we do have to uh, break it off at some point. So um, thanks very much uh, to um, Kermit Roosevelt the, the third for this illuminating, fantastic discussion. And um, uh, we have to say goodbye now. So goodbye until next time uh, when Glasnost will continue to ask the question, um, we have tried everything else. Uh, can we try thinking about it? <laughs>